Welcome back, Falcons, and this will be Chapter 8, Part 4. And now we've got our muse, our object of focus, back in the room after a potty break and the first, up, uh, first video being uploaded in the time that that took. He decided to come out and join us, so that's good. Um, before we get started, once again, let's gather together in a moment of prayer as we're going to be talking about the very serious, very serious um, critical issue of abortion. Let's, let's call to mind um, who we are as children of God, who we are as His masterpiece of creation, and all of those um, whose lives were ended really before they began and were experienced. So let's just take a moment and call to mind um, Again, being in God's presence. Thank you, dear Lord, dear Lord, gracious, loving God. Thank you for all the many blessings in our lives, for the richness of our lives. Uh, thank you for all the blessings and the gift of our life. Um, again, on this Mother's Day, that our mothers recognized the gift of who we are as your masterpiece and, and gave birth to us, Lord, in accordance with your plan. So we pray for all of the unborn whose lives were ended brutally, without reason, without purpose, uh, with abortion. We pray for them. We pray for a healing for all of the people involved in the abortion industry and those who, in fact, have sought them. We pray for their healing, that they may truly know your mercy and your love. Um, we pray for an end to this heinous practice. We pray... Lord, for all of the people who have asked for our prayers, for these and for all of our needs and all of our intentions, we pray with confidence in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we're talking Falcons, and it's chapter 8. Again, PowerPoints are out. Text, hopefully you've read the text by now. I'm, I'm asking that you watch this video. I'm thinking by, you know, Thursday, just like last week. And following along, taking notes, updating your vocab, please writing down any questions that you might have. Abortion. Abortion. This medical procedure very often, um, albeit a legal medical procedure, the deliberate killing of an unborn human life, a, a great evil, a, a serious sin, right? Um, just a tremendous issue in our in our culture right now very controversial very political but let's talk about let's talk about exactly um, what we mean when we either support the medical legal medical procedure of abortion or we oppose to it at the very least we should know you know what it is again murder is the deliberate intentional willful taking of a human life without provocation or cause an unborn human being represents the essence of innocence. They have done nothing. They have done nothing. They're, they have not attacked anyone. They pose no threat to anyone. Um, to deliberately take their life is murder. Whether it's legal or not doesn't change the fact that it meets that, that definition, you know, and that criteria. It is incorrect. It is erroneous, it is incorrect, it is not helpful to compare abortion with capital punishment or with the death of someone in the line of duty of a police officer or military type of person. In those cases, the death is brought about because of the actions, free will, and choices of human beings. In abortion, there's no action that the unborn are taking that contributes to their death. They have not done anything. They've not exercised their free will. They've not been given an opportunity to exercise their free will. So it is incorrect to compare them. And again, the church's teaching on this issue is consistent, like a straight line, like you were drawing a straight line and looking at it on the board. It, the church is steady. From the moment of conception until natural death, it is the culture that is all over the place on the issue of abortion. Um, 
regardless of the position on abortion, to uh, support it, to uh, condemn it, again, let's be, let's be really clear about what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is a human being. It is a human being. It is a living human being. It is a human being from the moment of conception. And for this, we can turn directly, praise God, to science. We have it in our scriptures, and we've had it in our scriptures and uh, for thousands of years, where we see the, you know, this passage from Jeremiah that you know, before you were born, God, God knew us, God knew you in the womb, right? Formed you into being and so forth, right? But now we have science that backs that up. We have the science to prove that at the moment of conception, when that sperm enters the ovum, you have um, cellular division beginning with this burst of power, and there's a name for it that eludes me at the moment, but you have cellular division. You have um, a full set, a full and complete set of human DNA. It is it is alive. It is cellular division. It is dividing. What you have is a human being in the process of development, beginning with a human zygote and a human embryo and a human fetus and a human newborn and a human toddler and a human preschooler and a human elementary and so forth and so on. Throughout our development, what you have is a human being in the process of development. When you disagree, when a person disagrees that human life begins at the moment of conception, logically speaking, the question that begs to be answered is, okay, if it doesn't begin at conception, when exactly does it begin? And that's what you get. You get awkward silence because we realize that to answer that question, you got to recognize that then it becomes a matter of a subjective opinion. I guess it, it depends on who you ask. If human life doesn't begin at the moment of conception, the way that science attests to, the way that the church believes, right? Well, when does it begin? And now we see, well, like, you know, all over the place. It depends on, on who you ask. Some people for a long time felt that it began the first time that the mother could feel movement in her womb or uterus. It, it's a, a condition called quickening. Oh, now human life begins. For some people, it was believed that um, when the fetus could survive outside of the mother's womb, when it was viable outside of the mother's womb. Well, um, science and medicine have, wow, just developed and improved so much that that changes daily. A hundred years ago, if a baby was born when the woman was six months pregnant, it had a 99.9%, .9%, if not greater, probability of dying. It could not survive. That's not true today. There, you know, on a daily basis, it seems like science and medicine improve and increase the, the survivability of a child that's born prematurely. So what happens when you say, well, human life begins when it can survive outside the, the womb? Well, then what human life is on a sliding scale? It's not really a human being if it doesn't survive? Is that what we would say? So all of those, you know, human beings that were born prematurely and did not survive, I guess they really weren't human beings? It's a logic that doesn't hold up. It's a rationale that doesn't hold up. For some people, uh, human life begins with live birth. Oh, okay. And therein come the ghoulish, murderous uh, abortion doctors. So all I have to do is prevent it from being born alive. I kill it while it's still in her body. 
Oh, then it's not a human being. See how that works? See how that works? Oh, it's not a human being until it's born alive. So if I kill it while it's still in her body, it's not a human being. Um, it just depends on who you ask. A few years ago, the uh, uh, president of Planned Parenthood, I was trying to think of her office, sorry, I guess it would be the president of Planned Parenthood, uh, Richards. What was her name? Camille Richards? Richards is her last name. Her mother was Ann Richards, was the governor of, of the state of Texas. But anyway, or Cecile Richards. Anyway, it doesn't, it, the last name is Richards. She was asked in an interview. Are you leaving us? Okay, thank you. Um, she was asked in an interview on this very issue. When does human life begin? And she wouldn't answer it. She balked and there was a hesitation and, you know, awkward, you know, silence and pause. And she wouldn't answer the question. And they pressed her on it. They, whoever was doing the interview pressed her on it a little bit. When does human life begin? And her answer was chilling. And it reflects Planned Parenthood. It reflects people that support abortion. She said that human life began when the mother decided. When the mother decided. That's when human life begins. How frightening is that? Now, I am blessed that my, I had a mother that loved me very much. My mother's been uh, dead a long time. She's gone to be with the Lord. It'll be 30 years this year. My mother loved me very much. Because of that, I was blessed. Your mother loves you very much. Because of that, you are blessed. But that's not what gives you value or life. My mother didn't determine my value. My mother's love for me didn't determine my value. That's pretty scary because sadly enough, there are, there are people in this world, and you know it as well as I do, who have mothers that don't care very much for their children, that don't love their children. Does that mean that those people have no value? Uh, but according to Ms. Richards, that's when, when life began. Right? When life began was when the mother said so. And of course, according to Planned Parenthood and people that support abortion, fathers have no rights whatsoever. They have responsibilities, but they have no rights, um, which is another uh, inconsistency, another hypocrisy in the Planned Parenthood uh, movement. Okay, um, Back to the question, when does human life begin? When, you know... When, when it's anything other than at the moment of conception that one more time, and please verify it on your own, it's pretty easy to do on, you know, with your access to the internet, human life begins at conception. Science has proven that. And to say otherwise becomes really scary because then the value of human life depends upon what other people say. That's pretty scary. That's pretty scary when other people can say this person isn't human, this person no longer has value, therefore this person's life can be ended. That's what the pro-abortion movement supports. That's what people inadvertently um, in their support of it are saying yes to. Okay, Whew, that's a lot so far, um, <clears throat> Falcons, on this issue, right? On this issue, the church is clear on this. I agree with the church, the diocese, the school, agree with the church on this issue. There is no sitting on the fence on this issue. You either support and uphold the value of human life and the unborn, or you don't. And if you don't, again, then it becomes... Uh, very, very subjective and dependent on who you ask. And the last time I checked, I think there were about 6 billion people on the face of the earth. And what we're suggesting is that human life depends on which of those 6 billion people that you ask. Okay, so um, as I'm looking and we're talking about this issue, and I'm sorry that we're not in class. I really am. I feel so passionate about this issue. And I love to be able to discuss it and to go through it. And I'm so, so sorry um, that we're not able to do that. So I'm going to do my best to deal with it here. Um, on the issue of abortion, which was made a legal medical procedure in, uh, with the Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade, 
And in that Supreme Court decision, the justices, as part of their decision, said that this was a medical matter between a woman and her physician. I don't believe the justices at the time had any idea of how far uh, the issue of abortion would would go with their decision. Um, their decision, again, uh, saying that this was a medical matter between a woman and her physician. People that support abortion and the abortion industry, which is a billion, multi-billion dollar industry and a very powerful political movement, by the way, they, they contribute tremendously to people's campaigns. Um, it's a profitable business, for one thing, but the abortion industry is an advocate for abortion on demand. And what that means, ladies and gentlemen, abortion on demand means that a woman should be allowed to have an abortion anytime she wants, without question, at any point during her pregnancy, and for any reason. That's what they want. That's what they want. That is the legislation that they want. And they pawn it off on the rest of us as reproductive rights. It's not reproductive rights. It's not a reproductive, it's not a health matter for the woman. They want abortion on demand. They literally want the legislation and one of the last candidates for president of the United States, a woman, was very clear on this because she was asked this question. Abortion on demand. She can be nine months pregnant. She can be in active labor. And she decides at that moment she didn't want to be a mom. She should be allowed to have an abortion right then, right there, no questions asked. And she doesn't have to tell the father. She certainly doesn't have to ask the father's permission. It is ghoulish. It is horrible. It is infanticide. It is, it is murder to suggest that a woman can abort a child because it's a boy and she wanted a girl. A woman can abort a child and kill it into child's life because well, she's decided she wants to go back to grad school, and this is not a convenient time. She can abort a child because she had a dream last night that her baby was going to grow up to be gay. She can abort a child without question. All she needs is money, and it's a cash industry. It's a cash business. All she'll need to do is plunk down the money for it. Um, she should be able to have an abortion for any reason. So she and her husband are trying to have a child. They spend a couple of years trying to have a child. She finds out she's pregnant. She's delighted that she finds out she's pregnant. But then she finds out her husband has been having an affair, has been cheating with somebody else. So she has an abortion just to hurt him. Yep, that should be allowed for any reason under the sun, for any reason. Okay, um, that's what they want. And, you know, it occurs, it happens. You can look at statistics and see um, how many abortions are performed annually, how many abortions are performed on women who have already had an abortion, women who use it as a form of contraception, right? Um, for any reason. And the, the horror of that, the injustice of that, the genocide of that, the eugenics of that in many, uh, in many cases as well. Hitting, more, hitting certain populations much more severely than others. Um, we would disagree with that. It's horrifying. The fact that the father of that child has no say in it whatsoever is such an injustice. It is such an outrageous injustice. I will never understand why the men in this country are not shaking their fists and demanding that the laws be changed. If you have a consensual, a two, let's just presume that you're consenting adults, you're of the age where you can consent to have a sexual encounter with someone. 
So two consenting adults have, you know, sexual relations, have intercourse. She gets pregnant from that, um, you know, from that encounter. The law does not require her to tell him that she is pregnant with his child. She can go and have an abortion. The law does not uh, require her to seek his permission or to advise him. Oh, so if she decides to end his child's life, that's perfectly acceptable within the law. But if she decides in, in her own estimation uh, that the child has worth and she decides to allow the child to live and she gives birth to it, while he's on the hook for 18 years, that's his child. He better pay for it. He better foot the bill for 18 years. And if he doesn't, he's a deadbeat dad. Let's go get him. Let's take him to court. It is so unjust. It is so... Um, it is just so unequal and unjust. I will never understand um, why men are not outraged by that. It is outrageous, the abortion industry. Now let's take a look. I'm looking at the time. Uh, let's take a look at some of the arguments that are given to support abortion. And the arguments that are given to support abortion, ladies and gentlemen, amount to a bunch of talking points, rhetoric. Just keep saying it. There's no, there's no real logic. There's no science. There's, there's nothing to support it. Just keep saying it. Just keep repeating the same thing until it, it's unquestioned by others. People just accept it. It's her body. 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 Her choice. Bumper sticker, right? Her body. Her choice. As though... That means I can do whatever I want with my body. Well, first of all, of course it's your body. No one's denying that, sweetheart. No one's questioning that it's your body. It's certainly not mine. If it were my body, we wouldn't be talking about an unwanted pregnancy. So I recognize that it's your body. But does that mean you can do whatever you want with it under the law? Not at all. That's absurd. That is absurd. Her body as though she can do whatever she wants. She can't. She can't. There are laws that will um, prevent her from doing certain things to her body. The law enforcement community, the government, you know, that's another bumper sticker. The government has no business in my uterus. The government has no business telling me what I can do with my body. What a ridiculous and absurd talking point. Let's just use a little reason and a little logic. You cannot self-harm. It's your body. And if you had the money to do that, you can seek to have one of your hands surgically removed. You're not going to find any doctor in the United States of America that would not be allowed. But wait a minute. It's your body and you can afford it. You don't even have to worry about insurance. Just pay someone to surgically remove one of your hands. No, that's not going to be allowed. Okay. It's your body. Nonsense. Um, it's your body. If you're walking down the street harming yourself, if you're walking down the street with a pocket knife cutting your arms as you go, someone is going to alert the police and they're going to physically stop you. They are going to apprehend you. They are going to take you into custody and prevent you from hurting yourself. They will put you into a psychiatric lockdown, if need be, for your own protection. Should we do away with those laws? Should we do away with those laws? Should we just be able to hurt our bodies if we want to? Because it is my body. And this is, um, this is a really serious point, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm not causing too much pain, but I want you to think about it because it dispels the ridiculous argument of people who say, it's my body. If that's true, if that's true, if it's my body, meaning I can do whatever I want with my body, and the government has no business telling me that I can't do something, well then, for goodness sakes, what in the world would be wrong with suicide? If that nonsense, and that's what it is, were actually true, what could possibly be wrong with someone saying, 
I'm tired. I don't like my life anymore. I'm tired of living. I'm tired of living in quarantine. I'm tired of living in, in isolation. So I'm going to choose to end my life. You know, my body? Do you know that um, government agents, uh, representatives of the government, first responders, police, um, you know, EMTs, fire, rescue, they would break down my door if they had reason to believe that behind my locked doors of my home that I have a mortgage on, that I pay the taxes on, and if they had reason to believe that I was going to harm my body and end my life, end the life of my body by my own choice, they would break the door down to stop me. And they should. And you see, the church would be consistent. Our belief in the value and dignity of human life is consistent and say, absolutely. No, you can't. I'm sorry, we can't let you harm yourself. We cannot let you harm yourself. We can't let you harm yourself. We can't let you harm others. Right? But see, what happens to the argument of it's my body? It's my body. There are people who are not, um, who would certainly pass, let's put it that way, people who would pass a psychological evaluation who would then go on and take their own life. Medically speaking, psychiatrically speaking, they would pass all of the assessments and then would go on to take their own life. How could anyone with this nonsense of my body, my choice, put up an argument against it? Oh, yeah, see, they can't. And what we do is, what, what, what happens is we're revealing this for what it is. It's a talking point. It's a bumper sticker. And it's old and it's tiring. And it doesn't hold up. My body, my choice. Nonsense. That doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want without interference. Absolutely not. Okay? Um, second point on uh, the abortion issue, on the, on the talking points, um, if someone is against abortion, immediately, it's, it's, it's really very sad and pathetic, but immediately one of the first criticisms that they'll face is, oh, really? It, 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 even in rape and incest? Even in rape and incest. And it's, it's a poor, disingenuous response. It is disingenuous. It's actually insulting. It's actually insulting um, to suggest, uh, you know, that someone has no compassion or that uh, we're going to exploit the victims of sexual abuse to support abortion. God forbid if a woman is the victim of a horrible crime such as rape and becomes pregnant as such, she is the victim of a horrible crime. If a pregnancy ensues, her unborn child is an innocent victim of a horrible crime. So in answer to that question, no, I, I don't believe we should kill children because their parents are criminals. I reject that. That doesn't make sense. Should we kill all of the children of rapists or only the unborn? That doesn't hold up very well. And for someone to, to levy that against um, a, someone who supports life, it's disingenuous because they don't care about victims of sexual abuse. Again, they want abortion on demand. They want abortion on demand. Oh, but they're going to use victims of sexual abuse in an attempt to shame or uh, make someone else look as though they have no compassion, right? It's, it's dreadful. It's a dreadful exploitation of genuine victims of sexual abuse. So no, we, we don't believe that we should kill children because their fathers are criminals. We shouldn't kill children because their father is a rapist, whether they're, um, you know, unborn or, you know, current children of rapists. <laughs> they, they are innocent of their father's crime. Um, it also accounts for less than 1% of, 
of all abortions that are performed annually, less than 1%, and yet that's the first disingenuous response that a lot of people have to anybody that suggests they support uh, pro-life instead of abortion. I want to bring up, oh, even in rape, oh, even in rape, so disingenuous. You know, again, they support abortion on demand. Statistically speaking, more than 50% of abortions that are performed annually in the United States are performed on women who have had, um, or have already had an abortion, at least one abortion. The number of abortions performed on women who are um, claiming legitimately to be the victim of rape is less than 1%. Less than 1%. And yet, you know, we're going to exploit that. Um, doesn't hold up. I'm looking at the time. We're coming up on 30 minutes. So that's a lot. We're not done yet. We are absolutely not done yet, but that's a lot for right now for you to take in. Again, if you have any questions, any concerns, please email me. Please reach out. Um, I know it's a difficult subject to think about, but I'm asking you to think about it for yourself. Asking you to think about it for yourself, to use reason, logic, science, as well as faith and scripture, and have a consistent belief in the dignity and value of every human being. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to stop it there, Falcons, and then to be continued. Thank you.